I want to thank my sponsor for this fourth season, Chiringa. If you are in downtown Alpharetta or going to Blue Mountain Beach down on 30A, go see my buddies Travis and Andy. If you like, if you like frozen drinks, that's a place for you. Welcome into the Ben Burnett Show. My name is Ben Burnett. My guest today is Roswell Mayer, Lori Henry. Lori, welcome in. Thank you. So you have been a fixture in North Fulton for, in, in both activist, elected office, very, very organized, very good following. You got elected to mayor. You ran the same time I did, so f- three and a half, four years, right. four, almost right. four years ago. Um, what, where, where are you from? Where did you grow up? Talk to me about that. I was born in Toledo, Ohio, and we moved down here to Dunwoody when I was 14 years old. My parents moved to Martin's Landing in Roswell when I was 17, 18, right around that age. My freshman year in college, I went back up to Ohio State to school. The. The Ohio State. The Ohio State. Go Bucks. Yeah. (laughs) Um, but. Um, you know, this Roswell's been home for me for oh, 40 years. When they left Toledo, was it because of better better economic opportunity down south? What was it? Well, actually, my father was being threatened by the mob. So, yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. We should we should talk about that. Now, uh, tell well, when when you when you moved down, was it OK? So let's. There were extenuating circumstances that led to you guys moving down south, Dunwoody, then Roswell. Did you, you left for Columbus for school and then came back? Yes. So what did you do when you came back and how did you, what gauged your interest from a political public service perspective? Well, first let me say that when I went to Ohio State, um, people made fun of me because of the way I talked. Y'all. When I, came, when I came home from Ohio State, people were making fun of me by the way I talk. Um, but I was never involved in politics. My first job was teaching school in Cobb County. Then I took over a family business, ran it for about 10 years. How long were you a school teacher? Five years. So that's a pretty, did you love it? What, what was it just family business? You had to make the change. It was a decision you had to make or tell it me about It was a that. decision I had to make, but I'll tell you that I was teaching middle school. Yeah. Those are and formidable years. Yes. Yes. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, I was a little burnout teaching middle school. It can be, uh, trying at times. And my father came to me and he said, if you don't take over the family business, I'm going to sell it. So I took over the family business, which is a complete turn in my career path because that was a pest control business. I was going to ask what you were doing. Yes. So that, although it probably has some similarities to teaching middle school, probably (laughs) also has, has a different thing. Was it good size? Were you guys based in North Fulton? How, how did that? Well, actually it was, it was quite an interesting business. Our, um, we had major, uh, commercial business. So most of the hotels in Atlanta were our customers, uh, Emory University, Georgia Tech. Um, we were the larger institutional, larger uh, hotels. Uh, but then we also had residential accounts. But what happened in the pest control industry, and the reason why we eventually sold it, was we were being regulated out. The EPA got to you? Yes, I'm they sure. Did. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm sure some of those regulations were healthy, but I'm sure they weren't all business-friendly either. Well, and, and what happened to us is the, only the big guys, the Orkins of the world, mm-hmm. could afford to make the changes that were being required by law. So it was just very difficult for us to do the training we needed to do. Um, and all of those regulatory things, it, it just became difficult. Are you still sensitive to that in your elected official capacity? When Absolutely. You, I'm sure that yeah. some part of that just changes yeah. you. The other thing, too, about running a small business is you don't have deep pockets. No. And, it's every and, two weeks. Yeah. And, and you're wondering how to make payroll and pay that chemical bill, and you're not paying yourself. And, you know, there's just it's always an uphill battle. We, like I said, we didn't have big pockets or deep pockets. We, you know, we had a decent living right but you know it was the kids didn't know any better right but the experience of that I think is really important because especially now that I'm in the city of Roswell that has huge deep pockets yes and that's it's kind of a interesting um 
back and forth in my mind because you know I'm thinking I think in in terms of being frugal but strategically planned yeah yeah when tell me about how you foray the first time public service just piqued your interest and the desire that you couldn't say no to it I got angry were you a red shirt <laughs> well I I guess I was I'm I'm not sure they're they're well known. Yeah. I, I've never I don't watch other people's city council yeah. meetings, but they are famous. We didn't have red shirts back then, but um, basically what happened was one of those zoning signs went up in my backyard. Um, it was one point seven eight acres, and they wanted to put twenty three homes on it. Wow. Yeah, it's a lot. And the zoning sign said, "Come to City Hall and look this up." So I did, and I just got involved in the rezoning process. And during that process. I had a couple of council members and the mayor at the time, Jerry Wood, uh, asked me to be on the design review board. And I said, sure, I can do that. Um, and so I did that. I really enjoyed it. And then it's interesting because people started to bug me about running for council. And I'll tell you this part about me that um, I don't know if people would anticipate or expect, but I was one of those kids in school, like, a student, you know, I was in the front row raising my hand. Um, I always had control over my education and anything I did. So I could make sure I got an A on that test. I, that wasn't an issue. But the thing that scared me to death was running for office. I couldn't guarantee that. Sure. No matter how it, hard it, I tried, it was a risk. Yeah. And I wasn't used to that. So it was, it, it was actually pretty frightening for me. But um, I ran one. I was on council eight years. I stepped down. Um, I was off for seven and came back uh, for one more year on council and then ran for mayor. Did you finish an unexpired term? Yes. Okay. And then what made you decide? At that point, you were running for that unexpired term to fill a, a whole seat. What, what was the event that happened where you were like, I'm running for mayor. I can't not run for mayor. How on earth is this place doing this, these things? Because I'm sure the day to day, like you vote and you go to meetings and you go to little committee assignment things, but I can't imagine that that decision was made lightly. Can you talk to me about your evaluation process of choosing to run for mayor? Well, and once again, that was, um, a lot of that had to do with, um, friends, colleagues that were encouraging me and we had a lot of long, very serious discussions about it because um, I had been on council for a total of nine years, but I've nev never had the role of the mayor. And the mayor's role is so much different than That's, a council member. Or my mayor will tell you, who sat on the city council seat for at six or seven years before he ran for mayor, and he was like, it's not even the same thing. No, not even close. And, and I don't envy... Because if I get hate, if I get hate mail, I'm sure it's ten times. Uh, but talk to me about really what made you want to be the CEO. Because we talked, we talked about this while we were mic checking. Roswell is one of, it's for sure. We don't know how big yet, but it is one of the ten largest municipalities in the state of Georgia. It's got its own Department of Transportation. It has. It is for those of you who listen and just don't know. Population, it's got to be twice the size of Alpharetta. It's mm -hmm. got to be really close. Right. Alpharetta has a great daytime population. Yes. But not a nighttime population. No, they don't. We'll get there. <laughs> uh, they don't. And, and it gets used against us every chance we get in every sort of... But your of, mayor is working very hard. He has done a great job. To um, put that into perspective as we deal with regional issues. Well, and, and talk to me about... As, as the mayor, as you get ready to run for re-election, that, that platform, what do you really, what do you want people to know about you? Because you have, right, people feel, I, I, most of the people that I know, what's interesting is probably started off as detractors and were more, now they're the people you find consensus with. And some of the people that you may have come in with and had a more like-minded theology, you move, you you move on into some sort of temporary alliances sort of way. How do you, what's the, what's the most interesting part about leading from the middle? And, and then well, talk about your platform yeah. and what you're proud of. Um, leading from the middle, it can be difficult uh, because there are, I, I've got a split council, three and three, 
and I'm definitely in the middle on it. But um, and I've said it from the very beginning. I never waver on my beliefs. And I think what has happened over time and what happens during campaigns is people get a preconceived notion of what I'm about and what my platform is. But that's not necessarily true because the real story comes out when I vote for things. When I exp- And a lot of times I can't vote because I'm the mayor in, in Roswell. The mayor doesn't have a vote unless there's a tie. But I always do express how I would vote if I had the opportunity. But and I've never changed from that. I you know, I've my platform, so to speak, has been the same from day one as it is today. And, you know, it has to do with um, not only protecting our neighborhoods. I'll tell you, it's interesting because when I go door to door, talk to people, there are four things now that people say that they love about Roswell. The first one is always great neighborhoods. Yes. People love the neighborhoods. Parks. Everybody loves parks. People in Roswell want to be out in the parks. The third one um, is interesting because it's always, it always has to do with schools and people want to raise families in Roswell. Uh, That's why people move. People did not move to Roswell for an urban environment. No. People moved to Roswell to raise families by and large. They love their cul-de-sac streets. They're happy with that. But here's another thing that has come, surfaced, I'd say, in the last couple of years. The fourth thing that I'm hearing from people now is diversity. Because they want to raise a family in a diverse community. They don't want the old 50s-style neighborhoods that um, were far from being diverse. And they want their children to, to go to schools with diversity. They want their neighborhoods to be diverse because that's what they're going to deal with in life you know you give your children the best start you can and part of that is is exposing them to all of the different things life has to offer so um so going back to my platform so to speak um it's important to me to protect what i my number one goal is um after you've moved to roswell what do we need to do to keep you here and that then that goes into everything from transportation issues, economic development issues. Um, You know, we've had a a huge um, problem in attracting economic development to our east side, east of 400. Well, we've really been looking at that. That's that's an issue that is being felt by our homeowners. Sure. And and how, how, what can I do? How can I change that so that Roswell grows and we continue not only to keep our residents happy in, in Roswell, but also our businesses, because it all goes together. It does. And and it's one of the things that I think is really unique. Politicians, especially at a local level, are really good at knowing where their boundary is. But 99 out of 100 people who drive down Highway 9 or up Highway 9 to go to work do not care. No. And, and nor should they. No. Because I, if you guys had, if you grew your business economy over the course of for, uh, for the next four years at 25 percent people that live in my city would benefit tremendously right and vice versa like yeah. the best thing for me to do for traffic is to make sure that this is a place where businesses feel like they're welcome because if you're at work three miles down the road in roswell you're not on the street right you're not on yeah. 400 you're right. not the accident that i'm waiting to clear <laughs> And yeah. so I, th- I do, uh, there's something to that that I think collectively the elected officials in North Fulton, and, and you honestly have to make it regional, but if, I, I wish you guys would, anytime you had somebody come into town that didn't, wasn't looking at Alpharetta, I wish you'd make the mayor the first phone call. Because he would be like, absolutely. If you guys right. landed 2,000 jobs, my people could come to work there. And he would right. do it. Sure. Um, sure. Talk talk to me briefly about one of the things that separates you from other cities around it, and it's probably some of it is age and infrastructure. But you have your own Department of Transportation. What is the strategy? Because it, when I look, we have a public works crew, and and we right. bid a ton of our own projects. And it's not a right way to do things or a wrong way to do things, but it is well embedded in your community. I see the DOT trucks every time I drive up and down. 140 or 92 Holcomb Bridge right talk to me about the strategy there and how you guys use them and then we'll from there we'll go into the uh T-SPLOS because I know that's going to be a big thing coming up in November right well and you know our transfer let me say this first 
Um, our transportation department does a great job. They also catch a lot of heat. Sure. That's the most unpopular thing you could yes. do. Yeah. So <laughs> if there is anything that gets people excited. It's traffic. Yes. And also, everyone is an expert on how you deal with that traffic. Yes. Uh, you know, I'm guilty of it. I have sat in traffic before, and I'm saying to myself, well, if they just adjust the timing on this light, we wouldn't be dealing with this. But I really don't know that. <laughs> My right. gut's telling me that. I've been here. You know you've been there a while. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I don't want to sit through two more cycles, but... I don't know what they've done to look at that. I don't know how they've dealt with it. But I think that the biggest advantage that we've got having a transportation department does come along with T-SPLUS and some of the major uh, road projects we're doing. And it's really helped us as far as our relationship with Georgia Department of Transportation. Who are awesome. Yes, they are. And, you know, I deal with electeds at that level, but we've got our transportation department that deals with staff at GDOT and they have relationships they work together the same thing that I do at an elected level so um, you know for me it's invaluable because they've built those relationships and um, and then it's also incumbent on me to build the relationships at my level which I think we've done a pretty good job with Um, and I'll I'll just give us a plug with the uh, managed lanes coming through on 400 um, I don't know if you know any of the history, but they uh, GDOT was not going to touch Holcomb Bridge. Bridge, which I do know that, which is, um, and I wanted another lane, so I wanted them to replace that bridge. <laughs> well, and and we were pushing for it, but they sure. were they, they were like, no, we can handle it. We don't need to replace that bridge, and that Holcomb Bridge bridge. We've got one way right now to get over four hundred, mm-hmm. and that's it. And I can tell you that. I and everybody else I know does everything that they can to avoid Holcomb Bridge Bridge. We, we don't get on it. You know, we'll take surface streets. We'll drive through neighborhoods. We'll we'll just get around that. And um, um, Russell McMurray finally came to the table and said, well, you know what? If you can, you're going to save some money on your Big Creek Bridge. And if you can divert that money of the savings into Holcomb Bridge, we can do a joint project mm-hmm. and replace Holcomb Bridge. Now, this is what is, gets me so excited. Until that happened, I knew that there was nothing we could do about Holcomb Bridge in my lifetime. I knew that I was going to go to the grave with Holcomb Bridge, Being the old three bridge, lanes. still intact. <laughs> <laughs> but now I can actually say, well, hopefully, God willing, that I will live to see the day that we have a functioning Holcomb Bridge. When I when you talk about of all the people that I have met and I I meet with him quarterly, he's the king. Yeah, the, he's awesome. In, he's in a the, great guy. In the state of Georgia, I that guy is worth absolutely every penny yeah. because if you're willing, we have a very unique advantage in Alpharetta because we border a huge county in Forsyth. Right. You guys are a massive city, and there's so many state roads between. Birmingham Highway and Milton and 140 at Howes Road and, you know, 372 there in Highway 9 and all the roads that we know, they have to be interested. And then Forsyth County is just absolutely enormous. And I just, when he asks you for anything, he, and you can help him, it'll come back to you at a time, times five. Yeah. He, he is, he, he's my favorite person it, in the state of Georgia that really, he, he means it. He's passionate, and he's passionate about all the roads. I sent him a picture a couple, I don't know, it's probably a year ago, at Browns Bridge when they were replacing the Browns Bridge, and I just said, name that bridge. And he was like, Browns Bridge, we painted it green. Thank God. Uh, <laughs> he's like, it was brown, it was heinous. Uh, he's like, I was so glad to get rid of that. Now, did you know before he became the commissioner that this was his territory? So he knows it even, no, I didn't yes, know Yes, yeah. He always talks. To, he's like, I, next time you guys meet with us, you need to come out. He's like, I need to meet you in Alpharetta because my family will want to go to dinner. Uh, and he's like, if I can just do that, I can be closer to the house. And he lives in Buford, so yeah. I'll. I, I don't want to give too much away on it, but he is wonderful. Talk to me real quick um, about the transportation special purpose local option sales tax 
two. Carl asked me to define that, who's on the ones and twos up there, because we didn't want you to get lost. But it is a sales tax that is looking to be renewed on the ballot in November. Yes. For five years. Yes. It is distributed amongst the 14 municipalities? Yes. Is it 14? Yes. 14 municipalities. Excluding Atlanta. So is it 13 or 14? It doesn't matter. Uh, yeah. Excluding mm-hmm. Atlanta, they've got their own. It is distributed by nighttime population. What does that consumption-based tax mean to Roswell? Oh, it's huge. It's absolutely huge. We've got It, it involves millions of dollars. And first, let me say, it, the easiest way to describe it is it's a continuation of TIS Plus One. Correct. So we had our projects that... Um, um, here in Roswell, we had big projects, and so many folks haven't seen shovels in the ground, but they're, they're still being done. We're acquiring right away. We're getting there. But we had large, large projects like the Big Creek Bridge. Um, but then also when you look at t Plus 2, so there's no – if we renew it, there's no additional um, sales tax. It would just be a continuation of what we Exists. have all been taxed at, at the – Current rate. Can you talk about the projects that the city of Roswell has chosen to put forward to their voters? You don't, and you don't have to, you can go high level. I know that roads or I know that trails and connectivity were something that you guys did a lot, put a lot more emphasis on for this time. Is that because of COVID or is that just where the market has shifted in your opinion? I don't know about the market, but that's what our citizens want. Uh, you know, our citizens want, like I said, people in Roswell love to be outside. They do. Yeah. You uh, have access to the most beautiful river in the whole state. Yeah. In, in several different places. It's, right. If I could steal something from you, <laughs> it would be that because my, my daughter, who is six, has said, Daddy, if I am ever the mayor, I want a river. <laughs> so... She, it is pretty like, awesome. I'm not going to tell her she can't have one because she may figure it out, but um, she may have to move to Roswell. <laughs> but Well, she might be the next female mayor. She could be. She's got a ways to go, but yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to discourage that. Uh, talk to me about the, the thought process of what to put out there and, and what your residents came back to you with. Well, I, we've got a number of things. Intersection improvements are always, you know, that's not a sexy transportation thing. But it does affect quality of life. And people like them when they're done. Oh, yeah, they do. They don't like them when they're being done. No. <laughs> but when they're done. And then also the whole cons- complete street. Um, and that's looking at major corridors in, in the city that um, we need to put trails in, um, sidewalks, to make it more pedestrian, cyclist friendly. That's really important. But also with the, I think it's important to note that with the major projects going up 400, that's going to, um, we need to relook at our collector streets and how we deal with those. So how are the traffic patterns going to change? You know, how can we facilitate um, a good outcome because of what is actually being done at a state level? So, so these corridor improvements, corridor studies, those are really important. And um, we here's another thing too, and I don't know if you're, having this issue in Alpharetta, but uh, it used to be that the state of Georgia oversaw all of our bridges. That that was part of GDOT's purview. They maintained and repaired all bridges, even even if they're on um, city-owned roads. They don't do that anymore. No. We we missed... I don't know that we missed an inspection. We had a creek when I first got on council, and there were four of us, because two were running for mayor, the mayor was running for secretary of state, and I was two months in. So to say, if you think I know something now, I really didn't know anything then. And yeah. they were like, we have to close Mayfield Road because there's a culvert that's going to collapse. And I was like, well, we should probably do that. I don't. I <laughs> oh, don't, you're kidding. I you don't, said that? <laughs> uh, well, I, when, when it came up, I was like, I, I don't remember clear as day talking to the paper. And we were they brought it to us in a work session. And I was like, you know, Donald Mitchell, who was the mayor interim at the time, was like, is there a point you're trying to make? I was like, I'm trying to make the point so the paper writes that this culvert's going to (laughs) collapse and people are know this road's going to be closed in the middle of the summer. And thank goodness that we did because, you know, you can't... Those are the infrastructure repairs that I hope that an infrastructure bill that comes forward out of the federal government 
nationwide, regardless of where you sit on a political spectrum, if it's going to happen, I really hope that they give the municipalities a say and cut the red tape because dealing with them sucks. Well, and right. And could you imagine <laughs> having a bridge collapse in your city? I did. I, 75, 85 oh, one, one yeah, time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was yeah. that was about as bad a bridge as you could ever burn yeah. to the ground. But, so, no, we have to stay on top of that. So, you know, and, and what we also looked at is where these projects are throughout the city, because um, it's important um, to have all of our citizens involved yes. in that. And, you know, if we have all of our transportation projects located in one part of the city, you really don't get the buy in. No, and, and nor should you. And people are getting are feeling neglected, which they should be. So for me, it was a geographical decision as well as a balance. So you know, a balance between trails and um, bike lanes, and and also intersection improvements and bridge repair. I think what you will find, and I see this from the loop that we have, that is going to wind up being you know, however many miles, people now when they come to Alpharetta looking to locate their business want to be on it. And I think from an economic development standpoint, when you look at it, it's like, why would I renew a sales tax for a trail I'm never going to use? Well, I'll tell you why. I think that there is so much value that you will absolutely, as soon as the plans are out and people know it's funded, I think you will see people those those corridors, especially like off ninety two, you drive down and it's it's not a secret. Like we've got our we've got our issues too, but like some of that is aging development that people want to turn over. It's also got great proximity to Highway Nine and Georgia four hundred. I think that it presents with the managed lanes project, and it may take ten years, but what an opportunity for Roswell, right? Especially in the northwest quadrant of Holcomb Bridge and four hundred. Yes. Um, that is, that's ripe for redevelopment. Yes. And that's our Big Creek Parkway. We'll go through that area, which gives us another opportunity um, to land plan that quadrant. And also, because it is on Holcomb Bridge and 400, there's an opportunity there to allow something in Roswell that we wouldn't allow that would affect our neighborhoods. Correct. And that's how we see North Point Parkway. It's the same thing. You can right. come with... I won't say an aggressive cam- canvas or template, but it's close to the right roads. It af- affects virtually the impact to schools could be very minimal. And you can do some really creative things when you start getting close to thoroughfares that where you know people are going to come from other parts of the state to spend a weekend. Right. I never thought when they did Avalon that people would literally come to Alpharetta. Why are you, why are you here? You know, even when COVID started to reemerge, it was a hotel that was at 97% occupancy and you couldn't you couldn't find another one in the state. And it's like, we can come here, we can hike on this trail, we can go eat dinner at these three places, and I can't get on an airplane. So what are you gonna do? I, I totally think that that sort of commerce center is so ripe for Roswell. And I mean, I it's not a secret. Being closer to Atlanta by two or three exits is a huge advantage for the city. Right. Right. What do you, um, what what are you really looking to do when you can do three terms, but you have to win a second first, correct? <laughs> yes. What do you see for a, a second term that might be just a little bit different, or how have you not not unwave not being unwavering or absolutist, but where has your opinion changed in certain things? How has time changed you as a mayor so that as you look at the second term? And I get rep- representing residential neighborhoods and, you know, everybody wants to know that cops are four minutes away and all the things that, you know, people run campaigns on. But what is the one thing that you see? Is it that managed lanes project and seeing it to fruition that you really m- motivates you and inspires you that you're not necessarily going to read on a rack card that you handed somebody at their door? Well, and I think the managed lanes, that's a great it's it's. That's a great example because, yes, I do want to see that through to success. But, you know, the other thing, too, with the, as far as my first term and second term, you know, I had to grow into this position. And, and talk, talk to me about how you do that because there can't be a book. The, no, there's no book. 
And I will tell you that um, I, like anyone else, have made mistakes. Sure. Uh, it just happens. Um, because like, like I said, there's no, there's no manual. There's, there's nothing to tell you how to do it. And then, you know, also um, at the time that I became mayor, we had um, four new council members that were elected. So it was, it was green. Yeah. And, and the two longest sitting council members had been there two years. So it was real green. It was very green. I mean, you know, the, you can't find the bathrooms in City Hall in two years. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it, was, it was a learning experience. And um, I would say the big difference now is that I've, I feel that my job is to keep the city on track and moving forward. I think it's my responsibility to follow through on projects and keep council moving in a direction that the citizens want us to go in. And what is what most people don't understand is that can fall through the cracks real easily. Oh, sure. Yeah, if you don't stay on top of it because, you know, somebody else squirrel and... There's a squirrel, there's a pandemic, you yeah. can pick anything. Right, yeah. And, and yeah. you know, I tell... Uh, we had looked as a city last year about rolling out a $50 million bond in the interim between the T-SPLOS because nothing is cheaper yesterday, today over yesterday. Right. And, and now you look at it and it's getting significantly more expensive. And I was like, look, I don't care if we send this to a ballot and advertise what the difference is on taxes. The people can make a decision. Sure. And I firmly believe that it's theirs. And I understand the other argument as to why you wouldn't. But I, I, want them to make a decision on a presidential ballot because it's your highest number of residents that turn out. It's a great time right. to do that. But it's also, you know, it's where you get the largest conversation, you know, as well as I do. What's your municipal turnout? 20%? Maybe. Maybe. And that's being nice, yeah. Ross. Well, go vote. <laughs> um, I can't really hate on you. Alpharetta is way worse. Um, but what would you... What do you, I, you guys had a similar conversation to the city of Alpharetta and we, there were three people that wanted to do a bond for parks in May and there were four that said, just put it on the ballot. Who cares? And you guys were the latter, I believe, to the best of my knowledge is that you're looking at infrastructure projects for your parks in a bond separate of T-SPLOS. Right. Do you, and, and the only reason that I voted to do it now was because at some point the treasury raised raises rates and your buying power diminishes in six or nine months may give you a 10 percent increase in your project cost and i can say all that and say i don't disagree with the people that didn't want to or wanted to wait i just i couldn't move i was fine and and it was it was one of those things but i want to you know, if you were going to invest in infrastructure and parks, and you guys have, if you have not been to Roswell, especially to the couple of parks on the river, I like to go to, what's the elementary school? It's right by Mayfield and Etris Road. It's before you get to Roswell High School. Help me understand. What I'm trying to think. Sweet of Apple Elementary okay. School. <laughs> Great school. It, 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 and it is. There's Alpharetta kids that go to school there. Um, but I think that you guys have just a park system and it's from decades and decades and decades and lineage of being able to buy property at the right time and you know I, the great thing about your park system is that if you looked at it in 2021 you'd be like there's no way that this is the highest and best use of this property but it sure is really nice when you walk <laughs> for miles and miles along the river because you don't get it back right um, no you can't ever get it back and i think and i give credit to the electeds that came before me because they recognize the fact that you can't get that property back. So there was a concerted effort to purchase property. Now, what we've done while we've been purchasing property to put into our park system is we had to put park improvements on hold. So, you know, for example, you know, your daughter might play soccer. And, and she does. And in Roswell, you know, you get stuck in traffic because you have to go to it. So could we use more soccer fields ball fields you know lacrosse fields the other thing too with sports as you know the um, sports are changing so 
you know, 15 years ago, we wouldn't have been talking about soccer or lacrosse. My son's eight, and he has not even asked if he can play football. Yeah. And, like, I, that's, if that's Saturday down south, yeah. uh, you, you, can't, you can't get away from the fact that there are some things that are cultural, but there are some things that are absolutely uh, changing. And so, I, you know, I, in Alpharetta, it's a, we have a very, very large Southeast Asian population, and they're not overly politically active as a, as a people or a people group. But, like, if you could find a way to build cricket fields, like, that is part of their culture. And figuring out that out with y'all or John's Creek would be super cool because you want to talk about a tourism draw? Like right. People would come from everywhere to come play in a tournament somewhere because sure. they don't exist. Yeah. What would you, you – you'd alluded to it a couple minutes ago. You said that there are things you learn and there are things that you would would want back or something. What is one of those things where you're like, if I could hit that shot again, I would. What's the what's the one if you could pick one? Because I think this humanizes people because the vast majority of your constituents only know you from the newspaper. Right. Even the <clears throat> really active ones that re, like watch city council meetings, there's probably 75 of them. You know, it's not... Right. It's not it's not the silent majority of people who just live there, keep up with it, pay attention on social media, take their kids and their dogs for a walk. What would you say is the one thing that Mayor Lori Henry would want to do again if she could do it? And, you know, Ben, you're, you're just being mean because I want to forget those things. No, but- <laughs> I, no I, I've got I've got a hundred of them. This is easy for me. Well, mine. Yeah. No, mine is easy. Um, and I hate to bring it up but um it would have been the tennis center yeah I, it was huge um and that was a huge mistake and uh, the mistake was in the way we were trying to roll it out we were actually trying to go to the citizens for the input but it was not perceived that way and rightly so i, sure. I i'm i'm not you know trying to justify anything that we did but but that was, um, in all honesty, that was me being new. Yeah. Um, and we were presented with what um, a lot of folks, um, everybody, it was unanimous on council, the rec commission, everybody wanted to move forward with it. But, you know, we just didn't do it in the right way. And, and if I could do that again, I would, because I think that we lost an opportunity there. And I understand why we lost it. Sure. Um, but I think that, um, there would have been an opportunity where we could actually have brought a tennis center to Roswell, perhaps not in that location, perhaps in another location, but, um, it was just, it, we lost it, you know, so. Well, I hope there's the day I, I, I played tennis all growing up through school. I hope that is the, uh, I hope that that gives you, I hope there is something out there because if it existed, there's so many Alta and USTA people, and I don't, and I really truly don't know the specifics, but I have to feel like, look, does it need to be like 500 courts? No, right. but if if there was something that could, you want to talk about a regional draw, like you're surrounded by it, tons of hotels, you're in one of the safest cities in the country. I think that it would be, I really, I would push you to look again if it was out there. Because I think that the appetite is right. Look, you're always going to have the people that don't want something. But one of the things that has really changed me, and you can't be – it's easy to tell people what you're against. Leaders tell people what they're in favor of. And to bring consensus, I think that – I truly think that that is something that you guys could t- – if, if, if that family was interested in coming to the table and doing it, I'd push you to go back. Because I don't think you were wrong. I, I, I truly do. And I get, I appreciate the fact that, man, there's things you want back all the time. You know, it's like, oh, that was an unforced error. I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have sent that email. Pick right. one. You know, and I don't really, I'm kind of, I'm not, I'm, I'm not really, I'm not on Donald Trump's like, I, team never apologize. Like if I do something wrong, I will, but I pretty, and you speak with conviction too. I, I, I'm telling you, I think you were right. Um, well, thank you. And, and, <laughs> and now, you know, three and a half years later, um, you, know, you know, you were right. <laughs> well, and now we're moving toward pickleball. Right. So that's the new hot thing is pickleball. 
So, and that tennis center did have pickleball courts, by the way, but... Um, it's still good. But pickleball can be done on a much smaller scale. And so I'm hoping that perhaps we can do some revitalization of, you know, some of our empty big boxes into pickleball facilities, which totally, which would be awesome. Well, I appreciate you coming in today. Is there uh, is there anything you feel like you wanted to say that I didn't lob you? I told you it'd be softballs. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I always ask the hard hitting questions, except for that one question. No, no, no that's that's fair. <laughs> uh, well, L- Lori Henry, I think you do a great job. I uh, I think you have a very difficult one, and I'm sure if it's thirty thousand dollars a year, it's thirty thousand too few. Um, and it is nothing about what you do is easy. Uh, and I appreciate anybody having sat in the chair for four years and knowing that my life is going to go in another direction, you have to have, it's not even that you have to have people that you agree with. You have to have people that you respect that come from a good place or willing to make decisions based on efficacy. And I, the thing I think you do really well is that you don't ever vilify people that go against you. And I think that at certain points that has got to be really difficult <laughs> But I do. I, I, I commend you. I think you've done a good job. I'd be the first person to say I wrote Lori Henry a check. Uh, it's it's hard to it, it, it's hard to find good people that want to do it because it's an isolating position to sit on council. It's a really isolating position to sit as mayor because you have to. There's a handful of people at any one time that you know. No matter what happens, have your best interest at heart, and we'll give you good, sound advice. So thank you. Well, thank you. I appreciate the kind words. And have a have a great day, everybody. This has been another episode of The Ben Burnett Show. See you around.